I think it's time. We're a few minutes over our scheduled time, so let's begin. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, uh, my name is Hillary Carter. I lead uh, research at the Linux Foundation, and I'm absolutely delighted to be your moderator uh, for our discussion called Show Me the Data. It's a discussion on the current trends uh, uh, for open source in the financial services industry and what this all means for you. I am delighted to be joined by uh, uh, our research co-authors, esteemed panelists, uh, Cara Delia, Tasha Allison, and Colin Eberhardt. And I'd like to give each of them an opportunity to say hello, introduce themselves very briefly, and then we'll kick off the discussion. Thank you, Hillary. Uh, Cara Delia, I am part of Red Hat's OSPO. I am a community architect that looks after uh, upstream emerging trends, including AI, sustainability, and am very focused on financial services. I'm Tasha Ellison. I am with Venos. I've been with Venos for about seven years now in different capacities. Uh, before that, I worked for uh, Credit Suisse for a very long time, obviously not there anymore, but um, in lots of different uh, areas, both in technology and in front office across risk, derivatives, and electronic trading. So I have a pretty good understanding of the full life cycle um, of trades and of processes. And one of the things that drew me to Finos was seeing all of the duplication across departments. And so it's very happy to be here to talk about how the industry is changing. Cool. I'm Colin Eberhardt. And uh, looking at the monitor here, I think I need a better profile picture. <laughs> I, I thought I'd go for the sort of action shot, dynamic speaker. It, it, it looked OK on my screen when it was that big. And now seeing it there and there, no, need a better picture. But I'm the CTO of Scott Logic. Uh, Scott Logic is a UK-based software consultancy. We've worked in financial services for many years. I'm involved in lots of Finos things. Indeed, you are. And uh, I. It's my privilege to have this opportunity to speak today about our collaboration. This is the fourth time we have um, produced the State of Open Source and Financial Services. And it was a groundbreaking report four years ago, and I think it's just as groundbreaking today to see the positive trajectory year over year. And um, it did my heart immense good to hear Gabriele Colombro, Executive Director of Finos, um, in his keynote, on numerous of occasions, citing the data that our research revealed and using these insights to contextualize what these trends mean for the financial services sector. And uh, I hope each of you will have an opportunity to download the research and dig into the findings and use this report uh, as a resource. I'll tell you a little bit first before we get into some of the uh, deeper questions about how we conducted the study. Um, as in years past, the study is comprised of multiple data sets. The first being data contributed from uh, GitHub repositories, from uh, contributors from financial services organizations, and measuring those uh, contributions from um, a list of, of banks and asset managers. Uh, the second was survey data. We fielded a study um, in the spring of 2024 and distributed it across the Finos community, uh, the Linux Foundation network, and also with a third party panel provider. And then we conducted uh, roughly a dozen qualitative interviews. And so the combination of these three data sets produced some incredibly rich findings. And we're going to discuss those findings um, today. Um, so to begin with, one of the sections of our research focused on um, open source use, open source consumption and management. And one of the most exciting um, data points was that 88% of organizations are using open source software and deriving business value from it. So I want to get into that element around business value. And so I'd like to ask our panelists what examples they have of uh, the impact uh, around open source software and the quality and how it's deriving uh, value for either your clients or members of Finos. Uh, what can you tell us about that? Do you want to, who wants to kick off? I can kick off. Um, so one, one great example is the Capital One implementation of Morphur. So Morgan Stanley open sourced Morphur, Morphur of some time ago. And 
Capital One decided to implement it to replace a pr proprietary DSL that they had in place that they used to manage complex business logic to do calculations on what we know are huge data sets. Um, and their proprietary DSL wasn't serving their needs anymore. As they looked at what they needed to go forward, it wasn't suitable, so they, they looked at more fear, and they adopted it, and they implemented it, and they're using it internally, and um, you know, speaking to the people, and, and it's created a better community all around. So not only do they have a new piece of um, software that they're using, that they're able to roll out to other teams, they can make those changes themselves, of course, because it's open source, and and it's not third-party software, so they're not relying on another organization to make those changes, although if they wanted to, they could pay someone to make changes. Um, and then I think one of the really things, the things that's really valuable is that it added value for both Morgan Stanley and for Capital One because they have this great community. One of the maintainers said, I get to have highly technical conversations with these people who know what I'm talking about, but they have slightly different views, so we often get to a better result. So they got a new piece of software, took them less time to market, like it ticked a whole lot of the boxes of the value of open source. Um, and, you know, and that's just continuing. So I think that's one of my favorite examples. Great example. I, I was just gonna say, there's, there's one way of looking at it exactly as you did, by looking at the point examples, and there are lots of them, success stories of projects where multiple organizations have benefited from the existence of a given project. But if you take a step back, open source is so ubiquitous and so pervasive, it's in every single part of uh, the, the modern tech stack, it's in every single line of business application, it is everywhere. So I think another thought exercise you can use to measure the business value of open source is try to imagine how you would operate if you took it all away. And I think most people would agree that if you took it all away, you simply couldn't operate. So I think that, that gives you the overall scale of the business value, which I think is a great accompaniment to the point examples that, that brings it to life. Yeah, adding on to that, I would say too, with the scale, it's, I was talking to um, Kay from Goldman Sachs and she was sharing how they are deriving the business value and OSPO is actually a part of the strategic direction when we are figure, when, when Goldman is figuring out um, what they are going to invest in from a technology stack. So it helps them to align their business to market trends, to be able to co-compete with um, you know, previously seen as competitors, and, but be able to have that really drive value into their organization. Nice, great. Um, I think one of the more uncomfortable findings from the report was the fact that only 50% of organizations are including security and vulnerability testing in their contribution practices. Um, what, how, how can we close that gap and get the other 50% to start uh, adopting best practices. So, yeah, so actually, um, Brian Fox, who is part of, um, is in the crowd and is a co founder and CTO at um, Sonatype, and Sonatype was very instrumental in this report, um, was sharing that it's a multifaceted approach. And so, it's looking at your tools, it's looking at you know, binary repos where you could have secure components, it's making sure that you are looking at other foundations like the OpenSSF and um, being able to be a part of their um, consumption frameworks. and really create the, the benchmarking um, that is not just within your organization, but taking it from the upstream and bringing it into your organization. I guess I'd, I'd put it that typically there are two sides to open source. There are the, the producers and the t consumers, the contributors and, and the, the consumers. And I think one way to encourage better security practices, what if you're cons most financial services organizations predominantly operate on the consumption side, and I'm sure that they would hope and wish that the contributors to those projects are, are following security best practices. So I think it, the argument flips around the other way. If you yourself are contributing to open source, adhere to the standards that you would like from the community at large. It's, it's a very circular relationship. I think we also need to, Last in London at the OSFF, and here already we've heard about it, um, there still needs to be tighter control on consumption, and you still need to have 
either OSPOs or we need more organizations to have OSPOs or open source councils of some sort who can help implement you know, all of these processes and so that you do do all of the security checks and, and really consumption through to contribution, someone to help shepherd that in and to raise it to leadership. Like this is a thing you need to fund because if you don't fund it, it's actually gonna be more costly to you when there are vulnerabilities that are discovered later. Um, and so I think it's raising the profile of, of those risks and, and while simultaneously highlighting the benefits and the values that you get from it. Yeah, and I think it's having evidence of what are the costs of um, not having security practices in place. We need to do more measurements in that area. What was the cost of Equifax's security breach? What's the cost of um, uh, risk management when it doesn't when it doesn't go well? I guess the problem is open source. It's a shared asset. So trying to work out whose whose responsibility is it to to address these challenges? Well. It, it has to be everyone's responsibility, doesn't it? Otherwise, the challenges aren't going to get addressed. Yeah, and it, I would add that part of um, helping address the challenges is to know what resources are available. Uh, communities like Vinos, communities like the Open Source Security Foundation, um, uh, online tools, uh, other resources that are available. And there, if you if you go to the finos.org website, you'll find a whole uh, roster and repository of, um, of resources to help close that gap. Um, and also engaging with uh, the Finos member community who are experts uh, in the field, whether it's um, you know our partner Sonotype, uh, an SCA vendor, um, or others. Uh, there, there is a community out there that can help close this gap jointly. So yeah, I think the adding on to that with the community can figure that out as a whole, but then that is going back into consumption, it's organizations risk appetite as to what they will bring into their policies and their procedures to be able to, to make it, mitigate the risk. And Claude, you're right that it should be the whole community that, that helps make it secure, but ultimately the organization who's consuming it is taking on the risk and so mm -hmm. they have to be, and especially in financial services, they have to be comfortable that they're doing, that they're managing at appropriate risk levels, right? Yeah. But also not applying the highest level of scrutiny to every single thing that comes in, um, even aspirationally. We're going to switch to our GitHub contribution stats. You heard Gab mention uh, this year that GitHub contributions by financial services organizations were up 26% um, and that more organizations, 46%, were allocating more time to contributions. Um, so what strategies can organizations um, deploy to help increase those contributions? There have been so many barriers pro prohibiting um, contributors from within the financial services sector. How do we continue to um, move those numbers up? So I think those numbers are actually already higher than they're showing because many times uh, developers are uh, back of napkin with their own personal device contributing to open source. Um, so I think part of that is figuring out the social policies because GitHub is for many financial institutions considered um, a social channel. Mm -hmm. And so it's uh, considering GitHub uh, as a, what's the caveat for that compared to like a Facebook or other um, personal uh, social channels. So in, in allowing the time obviously for development, but it is also allowing that the devices that they can actually use. It doesn't have to be their own personal um, device to be able to contribute. And I think that's going to go back into the security vulnerabilities is to, to help to mitigate risk. I, I think uh, a fairly fundamental thing some people and organizations need to understand is that the relationship you have with open source is very different to the relationship you have with software vendors who, who are providing a lot of the software and tooling within that you're you're relying on day to day. If you're using a a software vendor product and you need a bug fixed or you need support or, or or you need to get something inserted into the roadmap, you've got a contract, you've got an agreement. With open source, you don't have any of that. So the the way that you get bugs fixed, the way that you influence the direction of that project more often than not is through some form of contribution and participation. 
that that's how you, you, you help sort of steer these projects in a direction that adds value to your business. It's a, it's a very different way to, to work with an external party. What is it that organizations are afraid of? Why are, they, why are there policies in place prohibiting uh, code contributions for those who may not be aware of, of, the, of that barrier? Intellectual property has yeah. been such a, a challenge and I think it's incredibly misguided. If you look at the intellectual property that most financial services organizations hold, it cannot be expressed in five lines of Java, which is then used to fix a trivial bug in some framework for web content rendering. It, it's, I, I think it's quite ridiculous, that, that perception. And then there's also the, the, the point that there, there tend to be policies elsewhere in the bank that, that prevent IP leakage anyway. There's the employment contracts you have with the people that work at your organization. There are already mechanisms in place that should protect you. And that, that's the more technical side. Then there's the business value of why are we doing this in the first place. It's, it's a tricky argument. There, there are so many slightly odd perception mismatches that get in the way. Yep. Go ahead. I think they're, you know, they, banks historically are risk averse when it comes to not trading necessarily, but to processes because there's the, you know, the risk of penalty, like just being able to have conversations. I remember eight, nine years ago, you'd have to go through all the antitrust stuff. And before you even had a conversation, your lawyers would be, you know, making sure that you didn't cover these topics or, you know, whatever. And so I think, you know, foundations help with a lot of that. But there's also the kind of lack of awareness, the lack of the realistic risks as opposed to the perceived risks. And so that has meant that contribution just didn't get prioritized. And couple that with when you have an organization that is very, very large um, with a large technology force, then you either do a piecemeal up to department by department, which we see sometimes, and that you know, you're at least getting somewhere, but to do a wholesale policy takes time. And so I think that's where we're starting to see, so we're seeing more contributions and it seems like the people who can contribute are doing more, but now we need to get to more contributors um, across the whole organization and not in just pockets. And so I think that goes back to, again to showing the business value and trying to raise it up to leadership, you know, top down, bottom up, all of those things. And like conferences like this where you see successful collaborations. Mm -hmm. um, I think that makes a, will make a big difference. And we are making headway, by the way. When we did this report four years ago, it was something like 53% of uh, uh, organizations prohibited any kind of open source contribution. So the, the needle is definitely moving in the right direction. It's just we want to affect change a little bit more uh, rapidly or effectively. Yeah. Still not bad over four years. No, yeah, it's not bad. It's, it's, not it's bad. moved more quickly than I would have expected, yeah. to be honest. For sure. Well, good on you all then. Yeah, it's down, it's down to us, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> all right, another uh, nice stat from this year's report. 88% um, uh, is the rise in inner source contributions from 63% in 2021 to 88% this year. What's happening in inner source? What do you, th what, what do you attribute um, the growth in inner source to and how does it uh, relate to what we want to accomplish in open source? Well, I think inner source is the, uh, the baby step into open source. So, um, you know, with Red Hat being enterprise open source, that's kind of always the goal. But putting on just an open source hat, Inner source is a way to be able to create the change management within your organization and be able to get those stakeholders together that, you know, it, because it does take time, um, get the stakeholders together to be able to understand what is the value um, just from an internal standpoint and then see, and also with the risk of IP or data leakage, that can be all contained in house. And so it's being able, it's almost the prototype to then be able to open source projects um, down the road. Yeah, I think one of the, one of the challenges that InnerSource can help you tackle is the arguments around uh, creating time within a, within a team's day-to-day -day practices to write code that doesn't contribute directly to their existing products and their existing backlog. Because again, that's another challenge that you'll get if you've got 
a, a deadline in three months' time, you, you'll want all your development team grafting nine to five and possibly extra hours solely focused on that particular backlog and that particular delivery. And I think InnerSource, again, starts to help to create the argument about uh, reuse and adding value more broadly throughout your own organization without having to get into the difficult, tricky legal waters. Yeah, yeah it's introducing that more collaborative culture or a culture yeah. that values input from other groups and organizations and um, which of course is necessary but not always easy and it, you can start also celebrating other people's work too right or and more code reviews and peer reviews and so um, lots of value and similar to an open source community you can have your own internal community of practice so that you can be able to um, replicate what's happening in open source in, you know behind your firewall I think the other thing too to consider is that especially with uh, the, the dawn of AI, <laughs> or wherever we are, we're certainly not on the dawn, but, um, but with AI, you know, data being such a, a huge component of that, and especially how, did, how do you um, attribute data and where it comes from, when you are not being redundant with your data sources across um, teams, then you can be able to understand you know, where your data opportunities are, data provenance, you're gonna have better data governance. All right, let's move on. Time is flying, and I want to cover um, some future topics that the research identified, particularly AI and ML. Um, many respondents, 45%, believe that AI and ML is, is um, important to the future of the financial services industry. And I want to get my fellow panelists' take on um, how we, as a community like Finos and open source communities broadly, can help um, with AI and ML adoption in the sector? And what are the most exciting projects that you think hold a lot of promise? AI readiness? Oh, go for it. <laughs> I just oh, go yes. on, leave Colin. it there? Do it. Yeah, I, I think one of, the, one of the biggest challenges we have within financial services is not developing our own AI, it's how we actually adopt and onboard the AI, that, AI technologies that have been invented in just the past few years. Uh, I, mean, I, I use OpenAI as an example. They're probably the most well-known and famous, but there are a growing number of uh, organizations that are providing AI as a SaaS-style platform. And at the moment, it's really quite challenging to, to get permission, to get through the security, legal uh, requirements required to actually start making use of this technology. So I, I don't think it's about developing your own AI. By all means, if you want to do that, great, enjoy it, have fun. But I, I think there's so much amazingly powerful AI capabilities that are now accessible to almost everyone unless you work in a bank. <laughs> and that's the thing I think we need to solve. Yeah. Follow up? Any other AI yeah, thoughts? I think adding on to that, I mean, because we were just talking about intersource, I mean, even though we're in an open source environment, I think the same principles um, are really hold true. It's, you know, let's not reinvent the wheel, let's work together in this, let's find where we can have better opportunities, especially around the data, and to understand, you know, this isn't good. There are elements of it that will be um, competitive, but where are the cooperative opportunities? And I think one of the things that AI readiness does really well is around the governance and creating structure, because right now, um, AI feels very conceptual and is, as far as its use cases and broad and wide. So I think AI readiness thing helps to really rein that in. That's a nice segue, actually, to my next question, which is about cross-industry collaboration. Sorry, Tasha, did you want to I, add? I was going to lead right there, so oh. it'll go back. So carry on. Wonderful. All right. So on that note, um, AI readiness is drawing on past models of successful cross-industry collaboration, and I'd like you all to elaborate on, on some of those other examples um, that uh, have led to really um, effective outcomes for the financial services sector whether it's through Finos or, 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 or other forums? 
Um, so I think we have, well, what I was going to say, and maybe you want to talk to this, is related to how AI needs the frameworks, common cloud controls is also a very, a hugely useful cross-industry collaborative effort um, that needs just those very things too. Like, you can, being, no, you can you talk about it. You, 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 you're the expert here. Well, so Common Cloud Controls is, um, came about last uh, year and was brought forth by City. And what it is, is it provides um, an area for <clears throat> across the industry so that cloud providers are able to provide a compliant uh, infrastructure for the controls with, that are um, regulated upon. So what does that mean? That also helps to mean that there is not um, exploitation of cloud vendors as well. Um, and, and so that there's not one single cloud provider that is um, monopolizing uh, the market. And it's a, a standard creation through taxonomies being built through Finos and uh, with Finos members, and that includes cloud vendors. And so, as opposed to having three bespoke um, taxonomies for the different cloud provider, major cloud providers, you're having one common cloud control. And then that's also going to be able to help with mitigating security risks and, and reputational risks as well. Um, the, the Common Cloud Controls Working Group, or SIG, is welcome to anyone, and you are more than welcome to join in addition to AI readiness. <laughs> yeah, I think it's, it's, that, that helps make an interesting point about the areas where I think you'll gain most success in open source collaboration are those where banks, financial services organizations, do not perceive it as something with significant competitive advantage. Yeah. Because let's, Let's be honest, if there's a significant competitive advantage to be had, there's, that's going to, to understandably dissuade people from doing an open source collaboration. But when you talk about non-competitive uh, technology challenges, they are everywhere. Whether it's AI adoption, whether it's uh, compliance in the cloud, whether it's regulatory requirements, whether it's simply uh, a, a greater connectivity of financial systems. Very few of those deliver competitive requirements, and those are the, the areas where open source collaboration, I think, uh, are likely to be the, the strongest. Yeah, in fact, in the report, that's one, you know, one of our members makes that point. It, like, there's a small amount that you work on in financial services that is competitive. So if you can collaboratively work on a lot of those frameworks, a lot of those things that um, everybody has to face that aren't easy challenges, but if, then it frees up more time and more resource to spend on those other interesting things. So, and I think we've seen you know, already today lots like that's what's happening with FDC3, yep. with CDM, with open reg tech. I mean, can we stop reinterpreting all of the regulations yeah. independently every time? It's yeah, just so Don't put painful. the consultants out of a job. I mean, I, I work at a software <laughs> consultancy, and I've worked at a great many banks, and I can tell you they're far more alike than they are different. Yes. <laughs> no. In all seriousness, we'd, we'd quite like to open source quite a lot of the things that we develop and then move on to more interesting things. Yeah, exactly. Like OS Climate. Yeah, uh, I was just <laughs> going to say. Do you want to go ahead? Sorry. No, we're just we're, like we're reading great each other's minds. minds today. Um, so OS Climate is a pre-competitive environment as well. It's around sustainable finance. So it's based on the sustainable, de sustainable development goals by the <sighs> UN. And um, OS Climate, uh, within the last six months, I guess it was June, has folded into Finos and really is plugging into so many different projects that were already associated with AI readiness, um, common cloud controls, open reg tech. Um, I'll let you continue. Uh, I had the pleasure of doing the interview with Michael Tiemann for the research report. Um, Michael Tiemann is, is one of the uh, leaders in the OS Climate um, Project community. And it was sobering, to say the least. Um, we, we don't have a generation to uh, solve our climate resilience challenges, but it is inspiring to see how by bringing communities together, like the Finos community and the OS climate community, we can accelerate uh, innovation and development to help um, uh, fund our uh, climate tech solutions faster. Um, so I, I encourage everybody to get involved. And we have a minute left, and I would just like to say, because we are between you and the booth crawl, uh, which means drinks, um, what, um, what you want readers to take away from the research, what you found most um, inspiring? 
for me, I do think it is around the maturity um, because we are seeing the maturity every year um, incrementally growing, but understanding how to bring that back into the value into their business so that we can see those numbers increase. I want every individual or organization or leader or engineer who reads it to identify that there is a place for them if they want it in open source, regardless of what your organization is necessarily doing. And if your organization isn't doing enough, then bring them the report and be vocal. Um, so really just there is something in there that should meet everyone where they are in terms of maturity. Love that. Yeah, I guess if I look back four years ago, back then, you genuinely had to explain what open source is to some people within financial services uh, and, and try to get them to understand it's not just free software on the internet. Uh, that's not the case anymore. I think the majority of people, whether they're in technology or business, have a reasonable understanding of what it is. And, and the conversation is much more about how, how do we get involved, how do we engage, how do we improve the security of open source at large. So I think the conversation's moved on to a much more productive one in, in the last few years. Yeah. Definitely. Well said. And I want to thank uh, those of you who have helped us. Uh, nurture and, and scale uh, open source within financial services over the past many years. And uh, if I could ask anything, is just to keep, um, keep doing what you're doing, stay engaged, read the report, socialize the report. Um, there's evidence to say that, that these technologies are, are highly valuable to um, your organization. And um, I want to thank you for, for your involvement in communities. The report's available on the finos.org website. It's also available on Linux Foundation um, uh, research page, and we invite you to reach out if you have any questions about the material, if you have any questions about how to get involved, uh, please, we're, we're at your disposal. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.